there's so much worry now in the United States about China. And one of the places where that concern has come has been in the efforts of China for reverse migration. And I've been studying reverse migration, the Haigui, the sea turtles, um, and the whole effort to bring people back to overcome the brain drain from China. I've been studying that since 1991. Uh, and uh, I've followed different morphs. And then I was asked by uh, a colleague uh, to write a paper for a conference uh, on uh, the US-China education and some of these issues. And so I said, well, I'll take the paper. I've written a couple papers. You can find them online later. Um, I don't have my website up there. Um, but um, uh, I've written a couple papers on the rever efforts of reverse migration, and particularly the Thousand Talents Plan. Uh, I, you'll see my picture. I think I have a picture of me and Li Yuan Chao. Uh, I've talked about this before. Uh, the, he's the founder of the program. Uh, and. Uh, so so I've, I've talked on this, and, and now this has become the most vilified program coming out of China, and it has become a really big focus of the U.S. government, uh, the National Institute of Health, the <coughs> National Science Foundation, all of this has become, you can get the slides, you don't have to take pictures of each slide in any case, but, but it really has become a huge target as you'll see, of attack from the United States government uh, and even from uh, some of the people like Asia Society uh, uh, and the Hoover Institution have also raised uh, their concerns about this program. So I decided to look, to take this data set that I have about the Thousand Talents and apply it to the United States because the conference was about U.S.-China. So let me, let me get into it now so I'll g give you some background. But I'll, I'll, I'll try and start out with three main points. Okay, this is point number one. One of the things that I, I, it really strikes me, I, I made this point when we just did the podcast, the Americans don't understand what a brain drain is. Right? So when, you're, when Americans are trying to see what China has done or what other countries have done to try and bring people back, you have no idea what it's like to train your best and not see them come back. We know that as Canadians. We've sent lots of people to the United States. So we've had programs, South Koreans, Japanese. Everybody else has done it and just about everybody's lost. They lose, that's why it's called the brain drain. You lose your talent. And Generally, where do you lose your talent to? You either lose it to Europe or to North America, particularly the United States. So the Americans have no sympathy or no understanding of this effort by developing countries to try and overcome this problem. So the brain, the thousand talents in general is part of that strategy. As I said, China would love to have a problem of too many H1 visas. It's supposed to be H1, not HI visas, right? They'd love to have that problem, right? Um, second point, when this program was begun in 2008, the Thousand Talents, so from here on, TTP is Thousand Talents Plan, Li Yuanxiao was the founder. It actually was started, the idea uh, started one year before by the, by the people in the Ministry of Education, uh, but he made it a major program. And the goal was to bring people back full time. He said, I'm the man, you know, China's tried to, the Ministry of Education, Ministry of Personnel, Science, they've tried to bring people back full time. They haven't succeeded. You know, they can't get enough people back. But me, you know, as, you know, Woyo, Woyo Dang, Woyo Chen Li, I have strength, I have the party, I can get people to come back, right? That's what he thought. Well, it was wrong. But, but his strategy was to encourage Western you know, westernization of management, uh, overcome the, the kinds of renji guanxi tai fu zha, you know, personal ties are too complex kind of reason why people didn't go back to China, institutional biases, all these different, you know, he wanted to overcome that, right? But he started this program full time, but very quickly he found as well, he couldn't get people to come back full time. So he had to introduce a part time program which meant if you were a Chinese mainland professor with a tenure job, you could come and spend 
three months a year at a university in China. And that would make you a part-time participant of this. And a lot of the problem that exists with the current situation is the result of the part-time program rather than the full-time program where people are still living and teaching in the United States, but they're engaged and have joined this Thousand Talents plan. And so the FBI is saying that there's this secret group of people who have been put in the United States to try and eventually secretly transfer this information back. Third goal, and, and this I added because I've thought about it. The truth is, there's a lot of bad, there, there's too many bad guys out there. And China, I, I think on this issue, Chinese government, Chinese institutions, Chinese scholars, and I've seen some Chinese scholars, you know, complain about other Chinese scholars. There's a little too much bad stuff going on, as far as I'm concerned. There's a lot of cases um, where the most recent one, Moffitt Medical Center in Florida, right? Even the state of Florida, the, the state legislature has now established a committee to investigate the Thousand Talents plan and to see whether there's the, the, the scientists and researchers in Florida are using uh, fun, state funded money and projects and then transferring that back to China illegally uh, and trying to make money off of those kinds of things. And, and case, there are lots of case studies. In some of those case studies, though eventually, good idea to turn on the fan, in, in, in some of those case studies, the FBI has had to drop its charges. So, but, but still, for me, there are what some would call unethical behavior. But I think it's being way over-exaggerated, right? Can you say over-exaggerated or is already exaggerated, right? Is that redundant, right? Right, it's, it's exaggerated. Uh, it's securitized in this current context. I think that's really, I never used to like the word to securitize things, but this is really turning a noun into a verb. But, but this really is, really securitizing this, right? And, and what it really is, is it's not so much a threat to United States national security as much a challenge to U.S. hegemony, right? So that the U.S. no longer will be the number one way ahead of everybody else in science. China's catching up. Americans get very anxious uh, about this. Um, the other thing is it really fits into the whole decoupling discussion that's been going on, right? People are worried that in so many different sectors, whether it's, it's trade, manufacturing, uh, that the United States and China, after being closely working together for so many years, are now starting to pull apart. And this is one of the sectors where that pulling apart could happen. And from my own view is that's not good for the world. That particularly in science and technology, uh, I've done some research, not a lot, but I know some, uh, some cases of where people are really doing interesting work, collaborative work together, and if that stops, you know, that's really a terrible thing. So, um, so here we were, uh, Li Yuanchao uh, takes over the, the head of the organization department in 2008, and at this rate, you can see here, this is the percentage of return of non these are people staying abroad so five years after they get their phd how, what percentage of chinese in the united states with a degree in science or engineering was still in the united states one would assume if you had five years post phd you weren't going back so fast right postdoc Two years, you go back, blah, blah, blah. So this is five years. And this is when Leo and Chow right in here starts to get to work. Now, this looks like it's a big change. You're still talking about 85% of people who have a degree in science and engineering from the United States, mainland Chinese, who are staying abroad as of 2011, right? So again, the brain drain. 
an incredibly talented brain drain, so you want to try and figure out a way to get them that's to the most come back. Data. I believe that's the last because this comes from Finn, yeah. 2014. It's almost 10 years old. Yep. But my guess is it hasn't, I've, numbers I've seen hasn't changed much. Still 82, 83%. Could still be as high as 83%. Now, Trump has, President Trump has contributed to this, uh, the, the, the percent going back, and I'll show you another slide in a second that will show that he, in fact, is encouraging fewer people to come to America, uh, uh, less students. But in any case, so this was, as you had asked me before, can you get the data? So you can't get it now. This is the thousand talents Right? These are the thousand, these are people who signed up for the thousand talents. Basically, asked, could we get the data from the Chinese right. as to who is part of the thousand talents program? Right. And you used to be able to get it, but right. you can't anymore. I got this online, right? 500 names online. We could find them online, um, but it was only circa 2011 again, right? Um, and so just to show you about the part time problem, so here, the A Innovative is actually the research scientists and professors. And you can see that those who participated full time was only 26%. And those who participated part time were 73%. And the, this program would comprise 74 This particular sector, the scientists, made up 75% of the thousand talents people. Most of the entrepreneurs, so the Thousand Talents has scientists, professors, and entrepreneurs. But we're not going to talk about the entrepreneurs. The entrepreneurs tend to go back. And they have to go back because if they don't go back, their brother-in-law is going to steal their business. Right? So they have to go back full time. Right? They set it up. They got to go back. Sorry. Right? I try and be a, a little funny. Um, uh, a little cheeky. Anyway, but for the, for the scientists and the researchers, right, uh, the majority, 75% almost, uh, were staying uh, abroad uh, and not coming back to China full time. So that's the problem that Li and Chao and the Thousand Talents really had to try and overcome. There's me and Li and Chao, who you've probably met, right? Terrific guy. Liked them a lot. We joke about this, right? He'd still probably lock up your brother, um, but in any case, uh, you know, a really pretty good guy and uh, was forced out, uh, has retired, disappeared, and we haven't heard anything from him for a long time. Uh, I'm still trying to find a way to get in touch with him. He went to the Kennedy School, a uh, good friend of Tony Sage's, uh, so, and um, uh, he actually said one thing which was really, really interesting. He said that the best thing he learned in the Kennedy School was how to handle crises, which would be very helpful right now for the kind of virus, right? Um, so uh, here you can just see the problems. I won't go into detail because I want to get into the other, I'll, I'll just, but you could see this later on. Um, the thing about Li Yuan Chao was he organized a survey I did my own research, and a good friend of mine, Tsong Cao, who also does work on this, we did some research, we've done interviews and all that, but it turns out that the organization department uh, in 2011 did their own survey as to why people weren't coming back full time. And these were the issues that they discovered. And so when I met him in 2012, he asked me, why, why aren't people coming back? I had to give him a briefing. I gave him a briefing. And I, my answer was, Lingdao Banzi, Lingdao Guanyuan, Trenli Tai Da. Right? Guanyuan de Trenli Tai Da. The bureaucratic power is too great. And it turns out that he knew that. Sorry, he knew that, right? Uh, research, administrative intervention is common, uh, right? He knew all that stuff. Um, I, if we have a, if someone asks me a question, I'll tell you more about that meeting. It was actually one of the more interesting uh, meetings of my life. Um, in any case, so he he knew that, but so they had to overcome it. So this has been a real effort for at least you can document it through him, 2012, 2000, up to the end of the time when he steps down. 
He steps down in 2012, and then the program goes a little dark. I would say very hard to find out that much about it after he steps down. He's pretty open about it. Number, names you can get, you can find out who it is. After he, and then the other thing that of course happens in 2012 is Xi Jinping takes over China. And so this program also, I think, goes a little dark, right? Now, so I wanted to when find- When you say goes a little dark, do you mean it becomes less transparent? Yes. Or do you mean it- Less transparent. Yes. I don't so mean- it, it doesn't stop. It doesn't stop. No. It still hasn't stopped, even though officially they don't talk about it, which is one of the responses. Um, but uh, they, they uh, it's just nobody, harder to get information about it. The next head of the organization department never talked much about it. Um, uh, Xi Jinping, chi some Chinese officials or friends of mine would say, yes, yes, he's very supportive. I'm not so convinced. I think he'd rather use people who are in China and have come back rather than bring in a whole bunch of, uh, main, uh, mainlanders who have studied overseas because he'd see them as a slight threat of stability, right? All these foreign trained, right? The, we can talk about no, that. I, I'm not too, yeah. Chung Lee's research suggests that we're seeing an increase in the number of foreign educated members of the Central Committee and alternates of the Central Committee that we've seen under Xi Jinping, we still see, see, see that increase. So these are people who have studied abroad and come back. For two years, maybe. Not uh, PhDs. His, his minimum, yes. That's not PhDs. Some are PhDs, but yes. But not many. But not many, correct. Not many. They're visiting scholars. Those people, and then they haven't, Sisyang Gai Zhao, they haven't <laughs> changed their, right? They haven't changed the way they think. It's the PhDs. Yep who have been there longer, but it doesn't matter. I mean, scientists don't necessarily, or it's a lot of, uh, we can get into a discussion. I, yeah. I've got, that's, I mean, a, they're that's members, a good point. They're ministers who have had PhDs from U.S. universities. Sure, but that was, that was even before. The Minister of Education right. had a PhD, yeah, Minister before. of Science, yep. right, from Germany. Um, so that there have been, but not that many more, right? And it's mostly been in the financial sector. Right? Most of the people who came back were those people who would then go into finance and not into positions right. of political authority. Head of PBOC has right. a PhD from Correct. University of Illinois. Correct. So those are the financial sector has always been a sector where people were allowed to go. Anyway, I'm thinking more in terms of a broad number that they could be some kind of threat to the system. Anyway, so, so I wanted to prove, so one of the big questions was always, do the best come back? And the hypothesis was, no, the best aren't coming back, right? So I wanted to test that hypothesis. How am I doing time-wise? Okay, so I wanted to test that hypothesis. So what I did was we were able to collect the CVs of about 770,000 talents participants. So 10% as of today, but this was done earlier, was in 2013. So we had about 25, 30% of the entire number of participants in our data set. We had their CVs, right? And if you, when you have someone's CV, you can do all kinds of interesting statistical analysis. So we looked at three things. One was what's called the H index. Their H index is how often do their good papers get cited? So for example, I have an H index of about 35. So I have 35 papers that have been cited more than 35 times, right? So it's, it's the number of papers, uh, how many times they have to be cited. So, so we would give, so I would get an H index, I have an H index of 35, right? Other Chinese, you know, some very good Chinese could have an H index of 100. They could have 100 papers that have been cited 100 times. So we use that as a measure of their quality. One is, so this is how often are they cited. Second is how good are the journals that they're publishing in, right? The impact factor of the journal, right? So you can also use that as a measure. And then the third is just how many papers do they publish each year in, good, in referee journals, okay? So first thing is, I've shown this data before, but the thousand talents part-time. So if you have a 
three stars here, that means that it's very statistically significant. So the finding is very, is trustable, reliable, believable, and it says the relationship is strong. So the group that we're comparing these people to is the Chengjiang, another program called the Chengjiang Scholars, which is the Ministry of Education and Li Kaxing. They have a very strong program as well. It's the second most important program. And so we're comparing the part-time thousand talents people to the full-time Chengjiang people in terms of their H index, their their impact factor and their number of papers. And so this is not a bad 0.58, not a bad finding, which suggests that the thousand talents part-time are significantly better than the full-time people who go back to China under this program. They're also, right, there's no difference between the thousand talents full-time and the thousand and the Chengjiang people full time, which suggests that these people, the quality of these people has come down dramatically. So the full time thousand talents people are nothing are no better than these people, but these are better than them. So therefore, these are better than them. We know that. Right. And here you can see again the part time people, the people on the Chengjiang program who stay part-time means they've held their jobs in North America or overseas and joined these programs, they're still better than the full-timers. So basically you can say people who are staying abroad are better than the people who are going back. Both programs, right? So the best are not returning. So I have a paper coming out in the Journal of Contemporary China, which draws on this table as part of it's called the best are yet to come. I think of the Sinatra, right? The best are yet to come, right? What a horrible guy, but nonetheless, he sings really well, right? He's a mafia. God. Um, anyway, so, uh, so then for this paper, I then said, okay, let's look at, should say the thousand talents, not a hundred, the thousand talents in the USA. So first I would show, I wanted to show is the background of Chinese students studying in the US, right? So here you can do, this number's available, right? We talk, we've had presentations here on this. What's very interesting here is, so the total going abroad, right? The number of Chinese going abroad has gone up significantly, right? But the numbers going to the US has stuck, basically since, President Trump came to office, right? 2014 it was bigger, 2016 here, and the, for the percentage of Chinese students going overseas, of the total number, the percent going to the United States is dr dropping. And is At, this just university students or all ages? This probably is all. This could be all. No, that's just university. Just university? university and graduate. Just and graduate. Because the, the 2018 number is, is IIE's number. Right. Same as IIE. Right. I haven't seen the 2019 right. number. So it's in open doors. We got it. Open doors is projecting. They're saying it's still the same. Well, the total number is still the same coming to the U.S. It's, oh, it's dropped. Down. But, well, but the number coming to... But as a percentage. It's but as a percentage, drop. it's dropped dramatically. Yeah, but not the full. They're talking numbers. Anyway. Smile. Right. Well, you've got to look at both, right? You want to look at numbers and you can say, okay, America's holding its ground, but it's not really because the numbers of Chinese coming out continues to go and rise. It grows 200,000 people and the United States got none of them. Right? So if you look at this, the last year of the 2,000, 200,000 increased people, mainlanders going overseas to study, the United States didn't get any of them. Yes? Do we know where they're going now? Oh, you can go online. Yeah, where they're going. They're probably, yeah, we do, somewhat. You want to, you, you're shaking your head like you know the answer. No? Oh, okay. So they're going to Britain? I think probably Canada and Australia. Well, and Britain. Canada, Britain, and Australia are the three winners, but yes, Stephen. 
You were but they, say they, they can't take 200, I mean, it's right. too big a number. It's a huge number. Yeah. So, but New Zealand, I mean, just they're spreading out. Spreading out everywhere, yeah. Spreading yeah. out everywhere, right? But they're not coming here, right? So that's a really big, big number. Anyway, so, so then I took the, so we have two cohorts where we collected the data of the thousand talents. I admit they're old, but they're the best you can do. Right, so the 2011, and then we found another group. We had more people go and do more research online. First we had the 500, and then we got it up to 770. Right, here, 711. In 2013, we had 711 people in our data set out of about, at that time, probably 3,000, 3,500, which is not bad, right? And here we had at that point, we had 511, but you after 501, you got to drop some. So there was pretty much out of about 1,000 to 1,500, okay? So it's very clear the U.S. dominates in being able to recruit. China is able to recruit 1,000 talents. They're getting talented people from the United States. Now, can I take this off? Or at least open it up, okay? Right. So um, being able to... My daughter's laughing, right? So, so they've been able to recruit the, the best, right, in terms of the largest number. The other place, Europe does okay, UK does okay, right? And here for the Japanese, hi guys, you guys are filming this, you're in here, right? There you are, right? There's Japan, right? In my, in my, this is just in my data set. This is not the total number of uh, thousand talents who are, or, you know, Japanese studying um, who studied in Japan, Chinese who studied in Japan, who joined the program. This is only my data set, but it, I think the percentages are pretty good, pretty reliable. I can't be exact. They could be off a couple of points, right? Um, and then again, we hard, did... Hard to believe Hong Kong is that low. Uh, 16? 3.3%? Well, but it's only, they're only 16. I... In, in that period of time, I asked questions, and there were only 16 mm. people who were 1,000 talents. More Changjiang, probably, if included Changjiang. Yeah. Um, uh, but still, no, wasn't that much. I went around and interviewed a couple of them uh, at my university. But uh, yeah, wasn't that big. Anyway, so then we did the same kind of analysis, the same kind of statistical analysis by country. Right. And what we clearly found was that people who had joined the part time participants, so people who were still in the United States, right, were pretty much the best of the thousand talents overall. So they're the best of the best. Right. The other place I'm proud to say, the Canadians. Now, this is in terms of the the. Um, the quality of their publications and the quality of the journals in which they're publishing, but not in total number, right? Um, so this is, so again, the U.S. is the strongest and the U.K. has a strong cohort of people who are widely cited, right? Widely cited, but that's it, right? The rest of the people uh, sorry, guys, now for Japan, you can say that the, the thousand talents that you have, they're not so outstanding, <laughs> right? <laughs> sorry. Um, uh, anyway, and then we also looked uh, at the quality of the thousand talents with the UA US PhD, but um, I think these are part-time and full-time. And again, here you can see that the part-timers uh, uh, have the best, are uh, the best scholars. Again, the, and we're comparing them to people who return to China full time. So again, you can see that the part timers are significantly better than the full timers. Okay, but that's just for the U.S. group as well, right? Not for all of them, right? Here, I'm only focusing on the U.S. people. Jan, question. Okay, okay. And then here also studied and worked in the U.S. or studied and worked in other countries, right? 
clearly working in the U.S. makes you better in terms of the quality of your research. So you get a PhD in the U.S. and then you go work somewhere, probably teach part-time in the U.S. or if these are part-timers, quality of the people who studied and worked, I don't think this is necessarily part-time or full-time. Um, this is just people who worked in the U.S. in the program. And so it's very clear that those people who went to, got a degree in, in, in the United States and then spent some time working in the United States because postgraduate, once you've got your PhD, you learn a lot on the job, right? You learn a lot from your colleagues. You get to be a better scholar over time, right? Fortunately for me, I've had a lot of time to, since I graduated with my PhD, which maybe that's why I'm okay, right? My PhD was 1983. And Paul Spooner, who's sitting right here, was my roommate in 1976 at the University of Michigan, 43 years ago, right? Shh. A youngster. Right, and he, and he played for Columbia University basketball team. Um, okay, so, so this is kind of gives you the background information about the program. So it's pretty clear the U.S. has a lot of the best talent, the people who are staying in the U.S. are better than the people who are going back. Now, you could say that's really good for America. You know, right, Steve? You could say, you know, for America, you're getting the best talent. They're staying. The people who stay are better than the people going back. You're not losing, right? The reverse brain drain is okay for China, but they're not getting the best. The best are still staying here, at least as of 2013. That should be something to celebrate. Right? But we're not going to jump up and start singing, celebrate, celebrate, right? We're not doing that. Not if we're the United States government now, because they're bad. Right? <laughs> they're bad. Right? The criticisms. FBI, National Institute of Health, National Science Foundation, the U.S. media. Now, I would say their criticisms are not persuasive. That was the point I said at the beginning. There is bad behavior. There's no doubt it's unethical. The Chinese system is encouraging this. I would say that, right? Chinese recognize it. So all the, the negatives are negative. You can't downplay them. But it's just the, the scale is just not persuasive, right? In the, the cases that are raised, there's not even that much intellectual property rights theft. The main thing that people are doing is what I call double dipping. What's double dipping? So I'm a professor at Columbia, I'm a China mainland professor at Columbia, and I join the Thousand Talents Plan, and I get a position at Fudan, but I don't tell anybody, and I get two full-time salaries. That's the double dipping. That's the biggest crime that people are doing. Or I had a lab at Columbia, and I decided they've given me money, they're giving me a million renminbi. I'll set up a similar lab back in China. Now, it's also worth remembering, people do that because they love their country. Some people do it because they do it for the money. And I think that's an important part of the, the, bad, the really bad behavior. But a lot of the setting up, of, I mean, the whole purpose of Li Yuan Chao when he set this up was to say, come back to China and bring your quality and set up a lab in China. Okay? So that's a major transgression. Uh, two jobs or taking grants. So there's the National Science Foundation and then there's the Natu Natural Science Foundation of China. So there's the NSF and then there's the NSFC. If you get NSF money, but then you also get NSFC money, China money, and it's for a similar project, you should tell NSF. NSF wants to know. You have a, you have a legal obligation to tell them. People are not doing that. So that's the other thing. So people are, you know, on the margins of kind of illegal, unethical behavior. It's not small, right, shadow laboratories, whatever. But one of the big things which I found amazing, the National Institute of Health has now announced that a major indicator of illegal technology transfer is what they, if there's lots of people who are publishing lots of articles with Chinese in the mainland, what they now call excessive co-authorship, right? 
that those, that is a sign of potential technological theft. So if you are a mainland professor and you're here doing research, do you want to publish with a colleague in China? What if you have a full-time research project with a colleague in China and you're constantly publishing these articles with this guy in China, right? The NIH is going to say, ooh, potential theft. And right? how, how's NIH communicated that? Uh, it's in the, I think they've announced it, but it's definitely in the report, the Senate's report, the Senate committee has, a, it, what really got me going was this report published by the Senate Homeland Security Committee. They have their own Homeland Security Committee. And they published a report in November. And I took that report for this paper and I said, all right, I'm going to spend the time, I'm going to read it. And I'm going to read it carefully. I'm sorry? It's infuriating. Oh, good, you read it. Yeah, yeah it's infuriating, right? So it just fed me. Part of my frustration here, you know, is, is I don't mean to overstate it, but it is. Right. Is co-publication a problem in other countries? Say a, a, a Dutch scientist publishes a lot with his Dutch colleagues. Do we take offense no. that? No, and I would think that Indians are just as equally likely to be engaging in if they're, you know, ripping somebody off, if the Chinese are going to or the Indians are going to do the same thing. You know, Canadians are maybe going to do the same thing. You're co-authoring with people, you're co-publishing, you're transferring information. You're sharing data, right? That's the essence of co, you know, co-publication and co-research. So basically, I'm, I'm just spinning off the top of my head. This is really all about this, what do you call it? What did I call it? The deleveraging. There's De not decoupling. The decoupling. I mean, this is where the coupling is, right? Here's the coupling, right? So let's have decoupling. That's a good, I should make a note about that, right? <laughs> I, it's what I call creative classroom, right? When I'm teaching and I come up with, right? So, so decoupling here. David, is it just technology or any information? Because it's surprising that it's NIH who's well, coming up. Well, the reason that NIH is doing this, no, but the reason is the biggest problem or the biggest transfer is in the biotech. So genomic kinds of This things. is, there's a lot and there's, and there's, I, I can explain it in a second, right? Um, they published less, was right, blah, 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 so far, do not cooperate. Oh, oh, one thing that um, we do find, oh, I didn't put the I didn't put the table because it's, but we, we ran the data on people who, um, uh, the, the, the full-time and the part-time, and the part-time were co-publishing less than the full-time. So when you go back to China, you do a lot of public, of course, obvious, you publish with your colleagues. You know, you go to food, you, you retire, you leave the U.S. and you go to Fudan and you work with other people at Fudan. You do a lot of co-publishing, which helps, actually helps China shoot way up. We've now got a recent paper from the National Bureau of Economic Research, NBER, has a paper that shows that, in fact, the Chinese really are taking off uh, in terms of the publications uh, of their papers a lot and if you use Chinese language there's a lot of really good stuff coming out supposedly in Chinese quality Chinese journals where it wasn't happening five ten years ago it's getting better so some of these people will go back they'll do good papers but the people who stay overseas only about 25 percent of them I think are cooperating so a lot of them are not cooperating with someone in China or they may be cooperating with someone in Finland you know you're a mainland scholar you know, uh, you got a PhD, you're teaching in uh, Colombia, you know, you're going to work with Canadians, you're going to work with other people, not just with Chinese. But there's the incentives from the state to work with the Chinese, right? Um, now, so the double dipping, clearly a problem. This is the U.S. Senate Committee on Homeland Security, um, and the, it's called Threats to the U.S. Research Enterprise, the re recruitment. So they do have cases of double dipping. Uh, and I've already six, and six detailed case studies. They're in that report, there are six. There's number one, number two, number three, number four, number five, and number six. None of them involve significant techno technology theft, right? Um, now, one of the things that has happened is that because of this potential double dipping, uh, particularly in grants, 
the NIH and NSF have gone to the institutes where they find what they say potential risks of people, mainlanders who are behaving unethically or illegally, and they're saying to these universities, investigate these people. You have to investigate these people. Now, I can tell you that the universities feel under enormous pressure. I've talked to three heads of research at major universities in the United States, and the president of MIT spoke out against this whole problem. He says, it's way over, overblown, right? It's way overblown. Um, uh, and what they usually found in the cases, even in the reports, even in the government reports that are saying there's bad behavior out there, in those reports they're saying, we told these guys about it, they looked into it, and they weren't very upset about it because they thought it wasn't, the grants didn't overlap so much, right? The topics weren't, maybe they're similar, but hey, you know, as an academic, I got a grant for this topic, and then they're still working on it, right, Nan? And then you're going to go for another grant, and that grant is based in part on what you have found previously. So that's not uncommon that you would be doing getting NSF money, and then you take part of your findings, and you go and you write a grant that's related to it for NSFC, for the China money, and you get China money. And now that kind of behavior is now called double-dipping, right? It's not, which is just... We all double dip in that sense, academics. We're always building on the last paper and using, you know, you, I've, I've given some of this data before, right? I'm double dipping on my talks. You guys should kick me out of here, right? I'm giving you some of the same data twice. And the big bucks we pay you to give this talk. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, right? Usually I'm not allowed to get the most expensive thing on the dinner menu, they tell me. Anyway, so you don't have to worry about spending about if you're a financial supporter of the National Committee, don't worry, they don't let me get the, the veal chop usually. The, the veal chop, they say, no, no, you can just get the veal piccata rather than the veal chop, right? So, um, so here uh, in the report, I, I would still say there is serious misbehavior. So in one of these reports, they, they found 130 professors in the U.S. who were uh, uh, for NIH funding, so they found 130 bad people misbehaving, potentially. Uh, but at least 45 were the only ones that they said, you can't apply again. So 45 did something wrong, probably. So that's 130 out of? That's what we don't know. That's what we don't know. And the NIH should tell us how many, you know, pinion names, how many people with a pin, they could tell us, right? How many people with a pinion name have gotten, you know, for those of you who don't know, you know, you can always... When you do research on China, it's not difficult to find out who's a mainlander because of the unique spelling of mainland names. You know when it's a Hong Kongese, you know when it's a Singaporean, you know, it's just opinions pretty easy to, to figure out. So if they gave me the list, I could find it. So I'm trying and to... And why do you think they won't? Well, no, I don't know if they've asked for it. I don't know if anyone's asked Have for it. Have you asked NIH? I want to. So I'm trying to get a meeting. Do you guys know people at NIH? <laughs> Anybody got a good contact at NIH? NIH or NSF? I keep writing to Alice Hogan, you know, Marty, White, yeah. Marty White's wife, and they don't get answers back, probably the same reason my email's not working, because she used to do the NSF China. So I wanted, I'm going to Washington, right? So you just assume, though, that it's probably not a huge percent, right? And then I, the thing I mentioned to you. So the Commerce Department is criticized, right, for not stopping technology that going through its export licensing control system, right? That would be dual-use technology, right? Is that what it largely would be, right? They would stop dual-use or some of its dual-use are the more sensitive, the, you know, or just things that they don't want out. So the, co the Senate report criticizes the Commerce for not monitoring the, the licensing system that through which Chinese mainlanders in the United States are asking for the permission to send money, to send projects overseas, technology overseas, right? So they're writing this up to criticize them. In 2000, here's your numbers, Steve, in 2013, 2018, over 7,500 requests for licenses. Of that, 2,700 were Chinese. Of that, 20 cases were deemed 
improper, right? So that's 0.7%, less than 1%. And they're making an issue of that. I mean, they could say you should be, just be careful. But this is in their report. Now, how did the Chinese respond to this? So the Chinese have responded in two ways. One way is, as we know, the natural response is, no, 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 it didn't happen. It doesn't exist. No, 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 no. Butsun zai, right? There is no problem, you know. And so what very quickly they did was they sent out all the messages. A friend of mine got one of these messages and says, take everything off the websites. We don't talk about the program anymore, right? We, uh, it never existed, <laughs> you know, um, uh, right? Um, uh, but as I said, I did some interviews in Qingdao. They say it will still go on. Um, but the whole thing really to put it underground. Right? That was the first response. Right? Uh, Nature's got an article saying from NSFC saying, you know, don't talk about it, no more email correspondence. When you're inviting people from the United States to come back for an interview, you know, don't talk about the thousand talents. Right? Um, uh, here, the director of a think tank in China got a phone call from the Cyberspace Administration of China telling them, take the program off your website, right? Universities have taken down, right? So these are all examples of the, of the hide it strategy, right? Second is some people are, are worried about these criticisms. A guy like Raoui now can't get a visa so easily to the United States. Uh, Raoui was the number, this, one of the two or three most successful people with a U.S. job and who went back to China and became the dean of the School of Bio... Life, Life Sciences, thank you. Is that what it says yeah. there? Mm -hmm. That's good. Yeah, yeah. Right? Life Sciences at Beida. And he was interviewed and he says, it's <clears throat> very hard, my daughter's so smart. Um, I'm so proud of her. Um, uh, that um, he, he sometimes gets denied visas now. Right? But if under these programs you have to, you have to go back to China. And, but if they're afraid to go back to China now because if they go back to China, the Americans may not let them back in, even though they've got this position. Right? Um, now, one journal that we found, which was very interesting, is a journal called Jishra Funza. Um, I don't know enough about it. Uh, this was the article. Um, and it was pretty good. Uh, it reminded its readers that what I said, which was the original plan, was to get people to come back full-time. So remember that was the first thing they said, right? Um, one person who was interviewed said, um, because these people are staying abroad but have participated in the TPP, or the TTP, um, the head of NIH or NSF says that they're eating America's lunch, right? Surely, ba why, right? that they're eating America's lunch because they're stealing American technology. But a smart group of people came up with what I thought was pretty good. And we, this is a group to build on, right? This guy, Chang Zheni, I don't know him, right? They're, these are academic norms that should be abided by any honest scholar. I hope the participants in our Thousand Talents Plan strictly adhere to academic norms so they can avoid any adverse impact. A lot of these mainland scholars are worried that if enough people, you know, cheat, then those people who are legitimate are going to get burned, right? The Chinese expression, guohe, well, guo, uh, che chao, right? You cross the river, you burn the bridge. You get your stuff, but no one else can follow you, right? Another person, part, fake part-timing. So there's a big problem where people will say I'm a part-time, but then they never show up and they take their money, right? That's a problem. Um, and here, uh, someone referred to it as unethical, right? Um, uh, if China, and the China, it's interesting, if China wants to surpass its opponent at this critical moment, it has to have a normative system. So China just hasn't had, part of my argument would be, China has not had a good system to manage this, right? Now, why the problem? Uh, I've still got 25 minutes, so I'm all, it's time for questions. Yeah, yeah, I know. I'm, right, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I just wanted to stick in here. I've made this point again, but if I think about the problems, one is mobilization. You know, China has its way of doing things. Li Yuan Chao mobilized people. 
to, to, for the thousand talents. It's just it's a different way of how that you can criticize it. It's fine. You have a right to criticize it, but it is the CCP's way of implementing things, right? And then the institutions compete with each other, and then individuals are willing to take these opportunities. And then I also think that some people do this just because they love their country. We often forget that. Uh, I wouldn't put it necessarily at the top, but it is an important factor that I think we... Okay, concluding thoughts. Um, so, you know, for two decades, governments around the world have been trying to get people, find ways to get people to come back. And in many ways, this attack is an attack on government-organized reverse brain drains, right? Government-organized efforts for developing states. Americans don't see it this way. But states want to bring India, other countries want to bring people back. And one of the ways you bring people back is you give them financial incentives. Uh, you give them scientific incentives. You offer them laboratories. You offer them you know, good opportunities. And the Americans are going to suffer the worst from this because they're the ones that have the leading technology and where most of, as I've shown already, most of the best people are in the United States. Right? So if you have a program, if you're India, you're Canada, you know, wherever, you have these programs, then people, our countries, you know, the United States is going to be the big loser. But because it's become, it's become, um, uh, you know, system, uh, sort of strategic now because of the strategic competition and the national security, this has become securitized. Canada has a thing called the Canada Research Chairs. Salaries are about 25, 30% higher than a regular professor. Research grants are larger, automatic for seven years, 150,000 Canadian dollars research a year for seven years, right? If you get one of these Canada research chairs, are the Americans saying, hey, the Canadian government's stealing American talent, right? It's not happening, but it's offering significant amounts of money, right? But as I said, you know, it's the, because the U.S. is such a repository. Uh, diaspora option, I haven't gone into it here, but this was an idea that was raised at the end of the 20th century by scientists in Europe who were saying, how do we help the developing countries? What if those people don't come back? Well, then let's encourage them while they're in the diaspora to transfer technology, to come back and visit, to do joint degrees, to do all kinds of stuff. That was a main strategy, was seen to be very positive until now, right? I just leave this, I didn't even want to fill this one in, but all of the scientific decoupling, right? All of the programs, uh, you know, uh, you just undo them. It's just not going to be good for the world. Thank you. So what should U.S. policy be? What's the, obviously you think our current policy is wrong. What should the correct policy be for the United States? Yeah, I think, you know, most of us would agree that there is a problem here in terms of, oh, I can stand, it's easier. There is a problem here in terms of, uh, you know, for example, the Department of Energy, or the, yeah, the Department of Energy, which runs the nuclear program in the United States, they found that nine people who had joined the Thousand Talents were on their staff. They had people, nine people joining the Thousand Talents. So you could just simply say, you know, you, you, you interview those people without making, and just say, or you announce, I mean, the, if it's a secure, really security issue, right? Where the Department of Energy, you might be worried, that, do these guys have access to the nuclear codes you might say, look, these are guys getting money from the Communist Party of China, right? They are doing, they are getting money from the Communist Party of China. The Thousand Talents, the special thing about the Thousand Talents is it's run by the Communist Party. So you might say, look, let's be careful. You know, the, 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 there are reasons to be worried, right? It's legitimate to pay attention, right? If you find that people are double dipping, then you should punish them. Right? That's okay. But the, but just calm it down. You know, make the cases where there really are cases, you know, and, and ta even talk to the Chinese about it. Were these expulsions that occurred of Chinese scientists, were, the, were they related to the Thousand Talents Some. program? So the MD Anderson case, Correct. the Emory Medical case. Correct. 
Were those related to Thousand yes. Talents? Sometimes they are. Sometimes they're not. And, and the reporter will bend backwards to somehow make it a connection. But yes, they are. And did you feel those were legitimate, correctly? I didn't go do the research, but, the, I, you know, it's probable. I mean, look at the case in Florida, Moffitt. Well, well Jan, the, the MD Anderson, to its credit, after the researchers left, completed the disciplinary proceeding and decided that though there was a, they came out with then a statement, though there was a technical violation, it did not constitute uh, suffi a sufficient violation to um, constitute disciplinary proceedings. But yet six people... Yeah, but they'd already left, so, so they were gone. Emory, right. I believe, never... No, the two people left. They left. Yes. Right. So you see, the trouble is the Chinese leave before there's a procedure that's right. completed. And in some cases, as I said, the FBI, the first case in 2015, where the FBI first put out, put out its first official document, statement about the Thousand Talents, I remember reading it, right, and they raised one individual case, they dropped charges. The, so now one of the big cases is the Moffitt Cancer Institute, in Florida, where one mainland scholar uh, and the head of the institute, or one of the researchers, they made a deal and they've been transferring information and six Americans have gotten kickbacks and one Chinese, right? Now, they're saying that the Chinese was the ringleader, right, that he got everybody to do it, but the Americans still said sure. And are they, are they being examined? They've, been, they've all been kicked out. Yeah. So the cases are investigated. So, so you know, again, I'm, I, part of my reason for doing this is let's have a debate about it. Let's get it out. It's in the dark in America. It's like it's so everything. It's so evil that you can't even talk about it. I know if I go in and give this same talk in Washington, right, I'm going to be in trouble. That's why I like to give these talks here. <laughs> I got a friend. I know. I'm trying, trying to. I'm trying the, to. The trouble is I'm that you, do, to. you don't have the baseline number. I don't. Right. I'm not sure even if our government has, but we, you know, we don't know if this is one hundredth of one percent, one tenth of one percent, one percent or ten percent. Right. And your policy decisions are based upon what that is. But these guys are making policy decisions without that number. And the only case where they're giving us the number is 0.7%. Right? The only case where I've, you know, they and themselves have reported and they're ex upset about it is 0.7% in the Commerce Department. You know, so, that Senate report reminds me somewhat of the uh, 301 report, you know, where USTR wrote a report which was very conclusory. But when you look at the footnotes, when you take the trouble to read it and look at the footnotes, there's not a lot of there there. Right. that actually the, the, the truly quantifiable losses by U.S. companies are quite limited. But they say, oh, well, there are more that people won't talk about. Well, again, know. here, you know, in this data, the, the universities do the investigation, and they find that in many cases there's no double dipping, right? Or it's related grants. I mean, again, I, I, I want to make sure that I say there's bad behavior going on here. There is no doubt. You know, I feel like I, I have to say that. So I'm not a naive, you know, no one's going to say I'm a, you know, a shagwa, right? I'm not a, I'm not a, you know, stupid. Um, but, but, you know, show me the data, right? Show me the money. Yes, there was, yes, Miss Dr. Rivlin, soon to be Dr. Rivlin. What about um, social scientists? Social scientists where? Um, Chinese social scientists. I mean, he's asking when will they become part of this? Well, they're not, I mean, this is, that's not the risk. I mean, that's a different topic, right? That's C, does he want to control uh, the kinds of exchanges of what the, the topics, democracy, whatever, surveys. It's very hard to do surveys again. Um, I was just asking Jan. Jan's, you know, talking about her recent trip to China. Um, uh, uh, it, you know, it's very hard to do research. I don't know how, you know, on politics issues, I think Chinese uh, have to be very careful. 
um, uh, uh, in China. But this is really, I mean, part of this is, look, the biotech sector. Oh, I didn't mention it. One of the reasons that people do this is there's a lot of money to be made in China. You know, if you have, I mean, just think about it. If you had the, con if you had gotten a hold of the coronavirus, right, anti 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 antidote, right? Would it be worth anything in the United States? No. But how much is it worth in China, right? One, the scale, and two, because it wasn't there, right? So if you get a hold, if you're working in a lab, like you're working in a lab, at, at, you know, on cancer treatment, and you find something really that's really important, you know, in America, your company's making a little bit of money, but if you can get that back into China, there's so much money to be made in a year, the first year or two, right? There's just a fortune to be made. And I think that's part of what's driving this, was that people will say, look, I'm making, you know, $80,000, $100,000 as a researcher at some laboratory here in the United States. But, you know, I get approached by a Chinese hospital that says, God, if you can get access to that and bring it back, we'll make you a thousand talents person so that you can join the program, right, and get the money. But if you can bring that back, boy, there's a lot of money to be made. So it's what, it's what, I, what we would call rent-seeking. It's what I also call shortage. You know, if you can find something that China's in short supply of, but that's really important and useful, you can make a killing. Besides the Changjiang Scholars, yeah. are there a bunch of other programs there's four, similarly? There were four major programs. There's the Changjiang, there's a Chinese Academy of Sciences, the Hundred Talents, there's the Thousand Talents, and then the NSFC has its own, uh, what was it, uh, extraordinary uh, researchers. And now the Thousand Talents has the Young Thousand Talents. We have a question back there. Yes, sir. Oh, well, I may then not answer it, but go ahead. Elon Musk had the... Sounds like it's off topic. ...moving by the success of his Tesla operations in Shanghai. I believe have recently announced that he wants to do some research, open up a couple of research facilities, and invited Chinese uh, scientists to be part of this process. Right. Is Elon Musk in trouble? No. Well, he, in America, maybe, but, you know, every major... Uh, uh, every major corporation in the United States, a large corporation, has a research lab in China. There are over 12, what, used to be 1,100 that we knew of. Um, major research uh, facilities, IBM, uh, all kinds, and they hire mainlanders. What, is it, what does that say about decoupling? Well, that those people are going to resist decoupling. But that doesn't mean that if... It, it, I mean, the, what, what, what part of what I'm trying to do is to stop it from keep on decoupling, right? The business community is trying to find a way. I mean, you, the relationship's too important, right? You got to monitor it. You got to make sure that the people are going to behave badly, can't get away with it. You also want to make sure that it doesn't become such an issue of security and national security. If it's an issue of national security, I mean, if Chinese come in to the United States and steal, you know, the, you know leave the country with a, a, a drive that has the intelligence of some submarine, how to make a really quiet submarine, you want to nail that guy, right? The same way that the Chinese would want to nail an American who gets in there and does that kind of stuff. Spying is done. Both every, you know, America's not, no shortage of people spying. Uh, you know, we know that, uh, every, you know, Merkel's phone was tapped, right? We know from, from the, the days of, uh, what's his name? Uh, Snowden. Snowden. You know, we know the extent to which the NSA was, uh, you know, so the, the, the Chinese have to worry about this kind of stuff. Yes, sir. Can you look Tell us in? who you are, please. Ah. In addition to looking at publications, have you looked at patents? I, I haven't. I'm sorry. Who they want to know who you are? Oh, Hollis Hart. Okay. Have I looked at patents? No, I haven't. Um, uh, those there are data. Uh, I don't know about patent theft. That is something that the uh, U.S. China Business Council in Ch in, in, in China uh, will. Uh, collect information on. 
uh, or would do surveys asking people about how often they feel that there's patent theft. Uh, this is something, I mean, that's stay out there. Um, and I'm, I'm more interested in the policy. I'm a policy guy. I'm not really a, a tech guy, you know, so that's why. I, but I was trying to bring in an innovative way of collecting information to be able to evaluate this. I tried to get a paper similar to this published in Science. So frustrating because they wouldn't publish it because at that point I was only using the, the average annual impact factor measure. And they were saying, that's not acceptable. And then I tried to publish the paper somewhere else and they said, that's not acceptable. So then I said, okay, I give up. I'll go get the H index. So we, I had my research assistant go back and look at 770 um, CVs and get everybody's H index and the numbers were almost identical, you know? Yes, sir. I'm Bill Armbruster, retired journalist. You said you uh, evaluated, uh, based your rankings in part on the quality of the academic journals where they publish, but how confident are you that you know, say, the difference between the Journal of Molecular Biology and the Molecular Biology? Well, they're ranked. There is a ranking. Yeah, that's pretty easy. Uh, I mean, you, um, and, and we didn't in this paper, but in other cases, what you can do is, so for example, you've got to, do, you know, if you, someone publishes a paper in Nature, Nature's impact factor is 30, right? Other, and then other journals are less, so it's one big, huge, but also in different fields. So when we've done different fields, if you're publishing in meds or as compared to publishing in science, some of those journals will just have a different impact factor. So there's ways of trying to adjust for that uh, in your statistical analysis. I don't... Social science journals tend to have impact factors of three or five. Well, or even so. that's huge. 1.3. Social science journals are usually 1.3, 1.5. You know, if you're really good, uh, foreign affairs, I think, is something like maybe 10. The Chinese would used to pay 10,000 renminbi to anybody who got an article published in foreign affairs. I got an article published in foreign affairs, but I didn't get anything for it. <laughs> yes, Nan. Nan Sussman. Nan Sussman uh, has worked a lot on reverse migration to Hong Kong. Uh, has a book on it. Uh, so Terrible book, but nonetheless. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, I, I think until recently, um, the Thousand Towns program was seen as an ideal uh, in terms of government policy helping to bring uh, scholars back home. I mean, it was more comprehensive and so forth than almost by any other countries was seen. Compared to, compared to other countries. Well, actually, by social scientists studying, I mean, I've been looking at uh, um, how governments pull people back. Um, Maybe you can discuss, because I know you attended one of those meetings, uh, those uh, like um, like a trade show or a convention or something, where they tried to bring people back from, from the U.S. and they had it uh, in a big conference. Uh, well, every, every what, December, what like? yes. sure, well, every December, uh, it started earlier just Guangzhou, Guangzhou used to have right. the, the Guangzhou Fair the talent fair. Um, that was just their effort. And then it became uh, the Ministry of Education got involved. So people from the Ministry of Education would come down. The fair would get bigger. What they would do at this fair was if you were a Chinese scientist, let's say again at Columbia, and you had some patent or some idea, you would come and you would post it. And then companies would be brought in and they'd match you up. Uh, and then, the then it became the CCP. You know, the Communist Party got involved in this, and so it became a bigger issue. Uh, this gives me a great lead-in to telling you the Li Yuan Chao story. Um, do I have time to tell the Li Yuan Chao story? Three minutes. Anybody have a bird? Uh, the Li Yuan Chao story is really good. It's a great moment in my life. Uh, so I was invited. At that point, Li Yuan Chao sat on top of the, the um, Rensai Sitong, the, the human talent system. So he was super, the party supervised the Ministry of Personnel, the organization department, all of the different, you know, some, anything to do with talent, right? And he was on top. 
And I got to be part of that sitong for a number of years because of the research I was doing. And so I was invited to give him a presentation about why the Thousand Talents plan was failing. Right? So here's Li and Chao, uh, about as far as the wall. I'm about as far as to, from him as the wall. Six of us along the end of a table here. We're sitting here, and it's my turn. Yong Zhong Wen will get a Jiang Yijiang. Wei Shem, you know, need a need a Ji Hua Shi You know, why you're telling a member of the Politburo why your policy is failing? Right? You got to have balls to do that. Right? <laughs> anyway, so so I told him, you know, that it's because the bureaucrat's power was too great. Right? He immediately turns to the president of Dalian Li Gong Dashi at Dalian University of Science and Technology, and he says, "Jigeren shuo ni de chen li tai da ni tong yi bu tong yi." Right? So he turns to the president of uh, uh, Dalian, and I think he knew. I think it was a setup. I think they invited this guy because he probably had publicly announced that he didn't like the policy, um, and and so he turns to the guy and he says in Chinese. So this person has said that you have too much power. Do you agree or disagree? And then they got into a huge fight、um, about the thousand talents. Here's this white war in, right? I'm sitting there and I'm watching a Politburo member and the president of a university going at each other in front of everybody about why he didn't want. And I'm feeding it. I'm stoking it. I'm stoking it a little bit, right? Why they didn't. Why he he didn't want to bring back thousand talents people? He didn't like it because if he brought them in, then his own people would be challenged. The people that he had brought up through the university would be challenged, and also、um, uh, that was one thing.、Um, and he he said other people got jealous because there was so much more money. And Li Yuanchao just kept saying, "Look, oh, he says, you know,、uh, he said something about you know, bu gongping." The the head of the of Li Gong of Dali and and Li Yuan Xia says, "I'm not doing this for Gong Ping, I'm doing this for the Chinese development. You know, I'm not doing this for equality. I'm doing this for China's development, which I always thought was kind of interesting. And、wow. they, that, then we shake hands and have that picture. <laughs> and then what what happened? What happened to the guy from Dali? The guy from Dali was fired. I was going to say you, now he was either. He, partly, they said he was. His name was Ao, you know, the Chu, the the character, the Chu with the, you know,、um, uh, he was also accused of flandering. But if you want to get rid of somebody, the one of the easiest ways to get rid of them is to say that they're flanderer. But he was fired several months later. Maybe for what you witnessed. Could be. That's great that they let a foreigner see that. But we are out of time. Yeah. But that was a fabulous presentation,、thank、and、you. as I promised, it shed a lot of light where there's a lot of fog. So thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thank you.